1 through 9. Appreciate so much, Gary, reading that um, psalm this morning. Psalms 103, my all-time favorite psalm. I think every Bible I have has written by Psalms 103, my favorite psalm. Because in Psalms 103, if you notice, you're getting an insight into God's mind, the way God thinks. And that's very important. Part of our lesson this morning, I want you to be thinking about how does God think? We know how we think, but how does God think? The Bible is God's mind in human language. As we study the Bible, He's saying, this is the way I think. And He's wanting us to think like He thinks. As we learn to think like He thinks, different things happen in our lives. Changes happen as far as our lives are concerned. And we get to, we get to having different kinds of lives as far as concerned. It's exciting. I've entitled our lesson this morning, Man's Helplessness and Christ's Power. Man's Helplessness and Christ's Power. As we understand about man's helplessness, we begin realizing there's just not a whole lot we can do for ourselves in so many ways. But because Christ's power works in our lives, as Christ's power works in our lives, we get to do the impossible. So as we get to look, look at this lesson, this incident as far as Jesus' ministry is concerned, we think about how helpless things can be, but also what happens when Christ's power comes into a person's life. John chapter 5, beginning verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem a sheep market, a pool. By the sheep market, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, tongue, Bethesda. Having five porches. In these days, in, in, in these lay a great multitude of infinite folks, of blind, halted, withered, waiting to move the, the moving of the water. Verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the waters. Whoever was then first after the troubled waters stepped into was made whole and whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity of 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been uh, now a long time in this case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, put me in the pool. But while I am uh, coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and looked up, took up his, his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. As we look at each incident, each thing that happens as far as Jesus' life is concerned and his ministry is concerned, each thing recorded in the Bible, God is telling us, this is the way I think. Now look into this. See what's happening. See what Jesus does. See what Jesus uh, has for the situation, what goes on as far as it's concerned. Jesus is at a feast of the Jews. Now we don't know for sure which feast this is. We don't know if it's a Pentecost. We don't know if it's uh, tabern uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Purim, uh, Passover. Uh, the best evidence is that this is a Feast of Passover, but we're not for sure which feast Jesus is at at this time. This miracle uh, stirs up the religious leaders, which finally kill him. In verse uh, chapter verse 18, it says that they decided to kill him because he did these things. So each thing that Jesus is doing is scrutinized, being watched by, the religious leaders, as far as that's concerned, at this time. He knows they're watching him, but he does what he does. He needs to do, as far as this concerned. But the miracle, if you're filling out your blanks, your first blank there is miracle performed. Think about the miracle that's performed, what happens here. Jesus walked among the sick. sick. Verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 says that. So we see how Jesus is walking among the sick people. Spending time with them. You've got to wonder what he was thinking as he looked at these sick people. And all of them laying around there among the, the colonnades and, and around the pool, thinking about what they're thinking. He knows their thoughts. He knows their feelings. He knows how long they've been there, things that are happening as far as they're concerned. No mention 
is made of his disciples being with him at this time. So Jesus is by himself, obviously, at this time. Found his way to this famous pool of Bethesda. Now the word Bethesda actually means house of mercy. So this is a house of mercy, well-known place by the Jews as well as with other, other people as far as it's concerned. It's deep enough a person could swim in, in this pool. Beneath the pool was a subterranean stream which, uh, which bubbled up from time to time. As archaeologists and different ones have, have examined this thing, they found out this water coming to this pool is coming over the top of a mountain. As it comes down, if it, every once in a while it gets air in the line in, in, the, in the stream. And the air coming up causes the water to bubble. As a result, people thought that an angel caused this. And this was a superstition that the angels would come and, come and uh, disturb the water as far as the sermon. And the first person that was in the pool would be healed by their tradition, by their, super, their superstition. The superstition of the day was spread all over the world. People from all over the world knew about this superstition that these people believed in as far as that's concerned. People in the in the East, have lots of superstitions about water and what happens as far as water is concerned. Very interesting when you study about this. But also, could be that Jesus noticed the disability of this man and how helpless he looked. So as he's looking at, looking at the people, and he's talking to people, he's around there, he sees how helpless this man is. He chooses this man for this lesson, for these things to be done as far as he's concerned. No one could help him, could help him in the pool. He's desperate. Nobody's there for him at this time. Um, blamed other people. Verse, verse 7, he says, if, if somebody else is here to help me in the pool, I, I can be well, but I'm not, not, I'm not well. Jesus is always a friend to the friendless. Now, we need to note this because Jesus is a friend to the friendless. Sometimes we get to thinking about our friends. Who's your friends? Who are really your friends? Do you have any friends? Hopefully, you have friends. Hopefully there are other brethren that are your friends. But you know, it's amazing. When I studied this, I thought about different situations I've had with people and their friends. Not too long ago, I had a man call me in the evening. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, what are we going to talk about? He said, today I took kind of a survey. I got to talk about all my associates, people I'm around. And I realized, I don't have any friends. No friends. There's only two people I consider friends in my life. I thought, wow, think about that. Very serious, very sober. And I said, um, okay, who are those two people? He said, my wife is my friend. Wow, that's good. At least he feels like his wife is his friend. I said, who else is your friend? He said, you're my friend. Treat, I'm calling you. I want you to know, I cherish that. That's important to me. I thought, wow, he's been examining and thinking about all these things. A friend, how important it is to have friends. You know, a lot of people go through their whole lives and never have a friend. Jesus is saying, I'm your friend. I'm here for you. No matter what, I'm here for you. No matter if you don't have any other friends, I'm a friend uh, to, the, to the friendless. I'm here for you. Had no one to help him on earth. Have you ever been in a position where you didn't have anybody else to help you? You needed desperately for somebody to help you to do something, to get something, to be able to be healed, to do something, and nobody was there for you. This man was in that helpless, hopeless situation as far as it's concerned. Notice there's no lecture about the superstition. I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't lecture him about superstition. It's not real anyway. It's not important anyway. He goes right to the point of what's going on as far as man's life is concerned. He doesn't spend a lot of time on the superstition or with the superstition. Only... Only one desire that Jesus has at this point. Now, we think about the mind of God. Jesus is showing us the mind of God. He only has one desire right here. All kinds of things he could be desiring, but he has one desire. That one desire is to help. I want to help you. Now, think about that. If we think like Jesus, if we think like God thinks, learn to think like him, we learn to have one desire. I want to help. I don't want to hinder I don't, want, I don't want to make things worse. I want to help. Now, you've got to admire that about God and about Jesus because they were all about helping. They weren't about hindering or causing problems and difficulty for other people. So many times, I don't even think we intend to. We just get in the habit of hindering other people, hindering their growth, hindering their success, 
hindering their, their behavior. Hendrick said, going, wait a minute. What can I do to help? I just want to help you. True Christians, people thinking like Christ, think, people thinking like God, think in terms of what can I do to help? I just want to help this, this person out or the things going out on. Now, right here, we're looking at step one, the first step in recovery. No matter what's happened in your life, God is showing you the first step. This is the first thing that has to happen as far as recovering from the past or things that's happened as far as life's concerned. Powerlessness and unmanageability. This man realizes I'm powerless. I can't manage. I can't control other people. I can't even control events. And I can't control outcomes. Now, this is the beginning of salvation. This is the beginning of a new life. It's the beginning of thinking like God. As long as we're not, we don't realize our powerlessness and unmanageability, we think we got it. We can handle it. We can control it. So many people are so deceived. I've been there, done that, in their lives, thinking we can handle this. Anything comes down the pike, we can deal with it. God has said, no, 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 no. You're powerless. Your life's unmanageable. This man was powerless. His life was unmanageable. There wasn't one thing he could do save himself. Jesus says, you're the one. He's the one he picks, realizing the condition he's in. We see the conditions. Your next blank, there's conditions under which the power of Jesus operates. Now, he says, this is the way I operate. I operate with people who know they can't control what's going on. They can't control life as far as things are concerned. He gave his orders to men. Jesus gives orders. He says, this is what I want you to do. Here's commands. Here's things I want you to do as far as concerned. And as they tried to obey, the power came. Now notice this in this lesson. He tells this man what to do, and he tries to obey, the power comes. He doesn't just automatically say, okay, everything's okay. He says, wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to tell you to do this. And when you do this, when you give forth the effort, I'm going to give you the power. You see, I'm convinced that when we become Christians, we're truly following God. When we're truly following God, we get to see the unseeable. See, a lot of times we think we see, and we're not really seeing what God wants us to see. But when we follow God, we get to see the unseeable, what we couldn't see otherwise. But we also get to do the impossible. The impossible happens to people who follow God. Now, we're not talking about modern-day miracles here. We're talking about changing life, even greater than modern-day miracles. We get to see the impossible and go, wow, who knew that could happen? This is what happens. It always happens when people follow God and really trust God. It's one thing I love about my job is because I get to watch people's lives change right before my eyes. Get acquainted with them, get to talking to them, get to go over things with them and, get, and, and, and hear what their difficulties are going through. Then they, they apply these principles, these, these biblical principles, and get to watch their lives change. And I get to hear them say, I'm not the person I was you first started studying with me. You probably heard that. Surely you have. You know, I'm not the person I was. Changes have happened. Things are different. I'm going, no, you're not. Lady told me that just last week. I'm not the person I was when I first started doing this. I go, isn't that interesting? What changed? She said, my thinking. I think completely different. Well, that's what God is saying here. We've got to think different to act different. We've got to think different for life to be different. Now, some of you are looking at me like, what in the world is he talking about? Like a mule looking at a new gate. <laughs> that's difficult. But we have to do it to understand it, you see. Applying the principles. He said, put yourself forth and, and try this thing. The conditions were, do what he says to do, and then the power came. Jesus began by asking if he wanted, your next point there is wanted, to be cured. Now notice verse 6. He says, do you want to be cured? What kind of a question is that to ask a man? He's been laying there 38 years, couldn't move, couldn't get around, couldn't get in the water. Do you want to be cured? That's the question we need to be asking ourselves. That's the question we need to be asking others today. You want to be well? Do you really want to be well? You know, how much do you really want to be well? What a foolish, uh, it's, it's not a foolish question. Been ill for 38 years, might have lost his desire. See, some people have been in the shape they're in for so long until they lose their desire for anything to be different. They're just content with people, with things being just the way that they are, as, as far as that's concerned. Some don't want to be well. Some people don't want to be well. I've known people in the church didn't want to be well. They just want to stay just like they were. They didn't study. 
They didn't pray. They didn't give. They didn't do to participate. You know, just, just want to stay the way they were. See, some people want to be this way because other people wait on them. They'll take care of them. They'll do things for them. They'll provide for them. They're like other people waiting on them all the time and doing things for them and, and caring for them. His response is immediate. I have one thing. Uh, I have no one to help me in the pool. This man realized I have nobody to help me in the pool. There's not anybody that can fix me, nobody that can help me as far as that's concerned. First essential towards receiving the power of Jesus is have an intense desire. An intense desire. You next month there's desire. Now, to heal, to overcome, to grow, we've got to have an intense desire. Examine yourself this morning. I examine myself. I have done as far as this lesson is concerned. Do I really have an intense desire? How badly do I want it? A desire for what? For His grace. For His grace. Now what Jesus is showing us, what God is showing us through what's happened with this man as well, is God is showing us. He said, this is what grace is really all about. I'm giving this man what he doesn't deserve. Jesus would personify grace. Why did he do that? Because he wants us to personify grace. To be like Jesus, we're personifying grace. We're helping people see this is what grace does. This is how grace acts. Grace helps people. Grace has this, with, with grace we have this desire. See, grace sows the desire within us to go, wait a minute, I want to do everything I can for all the people I can, as quick as I can, not hurt anybody. Am I really trying to help or am I trying to hinder other people? Today Jesus says, do you really want to change? Do you really want to change? You know, so many Christians are satisfied right where they're at. No, I don't want to change. I'm just going to keep things just the way that they are. You see. Now, how do I know if I want to change or not? Do I have the desire? How much do I really want to change? How much do I want to be different? Different than what? We've got to identify, wait a minute. Where am I right now as far as my life's concerned? As far as my service is concerned? As far as my abilities are concerned? Where am I now? Then how do I want to be? How do I want to change? Well, it's so wonderful because we can compare ourselves to Jesus and go, wait a minute, what would Jesus be like if we forget about me and not act like me anymore and just act like him? What would that person act like, you see? Change comes as we focus on him, focus on his grace, and he brings us change. If we're content, there's no change for us. If we're content with the way things are, just want to stay the way we are, then we will, there's no change for us. We'll continue. If there is any change, it'll be worse instead of better. But examine yourself. Do you have the desire, really? What kind of desire do we have as far as this time concerned? Jesus went on to, uh, to say, get up. Notice he's talking to this guy. The next blank there are two words, or get up. Ask as, uh, as, as if to, to say, Man, bend your will, and I'll do this. We'll do this thing together. Get up, get up. It's time to move. It's time to move now. But Jesus is saying to us now, get up. No matter what the past has been like, it's time to move, to get up, go forward, to heal, overcome. Now, what's the opposite of this? The opposite is Satan says, no, just sit where you're sitting. Just stay exactly where you're at in life. Everything is fine. Don't worry about a thing. So many people in Judgment Day, there going to be people just like that going, no, I just didn't want to move. I just want to stay right where I'm at. Jesus said, no, you get up and move. You move spiritually. If you're the same place spiritually you were last year, this time, you're way behind, you see. Are you moving forward spiritually? What things are different now than you were last year? Are you getting up? And, and going with it far sir. Do this together. Our willingness uh, to cooperate is very important. Are we cooperating with Jesus? Are we cooperating with God? Admit helplessness. Then he'll, he'll give us our desires. He'll help us to overcome far as sir. Understanding that we're helpless. We can't do it, but he can. Jesus commanded the man, the man to do the impossible. Your next blank there is the impossible. He asked this man to do the impossible. There's no way he could do this on his own. God is asking us to do the impossible. We can't do it on our own. 
Now, the beginning of growing, the beginning of going forward is having a desire. And then going, wait a minute, I can't do this. That's what I tell people all the time. I've told you for many years, people in my classes and things, you can't live the Christian life. You can't live the Christian life. Always eyebrows go up. Wait a minute. What do you mean I can't? What am I doing here? I can't live the Christian life. But Christ can live it in you, you see. There's a huge difference. If you could live the Christian life without Christ, there would be no need for Christ. But when we go, wait a minute. I can't live it, but he can live it in us, you see. How does he do that? This lesson, this is what he's showing us. He says, you do it by thinking like Jesus thinks. You think like God thinks. As you begin thinking like him, you begin living the life. You begin doing the things, the, uh, doing the impossible as far as that's concerned. He's telling us, I want you to do the impossible. Get up, pick up your bed, Jesus said. Get up and pick up your bed. Can you imagine being there at that time, that place, that pool, with all those people gathered around, probably talking, chattering, sleeping, doing all kinds of things, and all of a sudden Jesus starts talking to this man. He tells him to get up. I'll guarantee you it was like it is right now. You could hear a pin drop in that crowd. And I'll guarantee you every eye was there, was on this man to go, is he really going to get up or not? Jesus has said, you can do it. It's going to happen. We're going to do it together. You want to, let's do it. Now, everybody's watching and waiting. Is he going to do it or not? I think there's certain times when it's almost like time stopped. Everything froze. The frame froze right here. And everybody's, what's going to happen? When this guy starts up to his feet, everybody goes, who does this? Day in and day out, we watch this guy lay there. We watch him try to get the pool. We've, we've been around him. We listen to him moan and groan. All the things that happened, and today, he gets on his feet. Not in the water. He gets on his feet because Jesus says, you get up, and you get up now. He could have said, I've been here 38 years. I can't move. Could have said. Nobody would have blamed him if he said, I've been here 38 years. I can't move. But this man, and you've got to thank God for this man, because this man says, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's see if Jesus is really what he claims to be. Let's, let's do this thing. He put forth the effort. Now, really and truly, God is saying the same thing to you and to me today. Put forth the effort. Put forth. Don't keep sitting there spiritually. Go forward. What does that mean to go forward? It means learn. Learn. And grow. Apply principles. Learn to pray. Learn to study. Learn to fast. Learn to meditate. Put forth the effort. But Rod, I just really, don't tell me. I tell God. Because all these things I've just mentioned right here in this book, he said, you do it. But so many people say, well, I tried that. Or I don't, I'm just not that kind of person. One lady asked me years ago, said, we was talking about this, and she said, if I become what you're saying, would I be a religious fanatic? And I said, was Jesus a religious fanatic? She said, I really think he was. I said, well, <laughs> you may become a religious, a religious fanatic. See, We're so afraid because we're so used to sitting there. But when this man stands up, the crowd paid attention. I promise you. It doesn't say that in the text. But can you imagine him not paying attention? When you stand up, the crowd will pay attention. Not physically, not physically. Mentally, morally, spiritually, when we stand up, people around us go, whoa, what's going on here? I can name different people in my family. I've named different people I've studied with. I've named people I've been around. People in the church stood up. It's no more. I'm doing it his way or no way. And God goes, okay. They got to see the impossible. God loves doing the impossible. He loves doing the impossible. When you see the impossible, you see a person's life change. You see a person saved. You see a person learn to forgive. You see a person learn to give. You see a person overcome their selfishness. God loves that. We see the impossible. I want to turn your Bible over Matthew 19. I'm closing here. Matthew 19, 23. Matthew 19, 23 and following. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly I say unto you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. At this point, Jesus says, It's very difficult. In fact, it's really probably impossible for rich people to get in heaven. Why is that? Because rich people are full of pride. Humble people go to heaven. It's very difficult for people to swallow their pride, humble themselves when they're rich. He says, very difficult. His, his disciples said, well, who can do it? He said, well, it's pretty much like a camel going through an eye of a needle. And he's not talking about a sewing needle. He's talking about the, the taut, tight rocks over there they call the eye of the needle. You had, you had to take all the stuff off the camel, and it was all the camel could do to squeeze through the eye of the needle with everything unloaded. you got to unload you go through the eye of the needle. It's not about you anymore. It's not about me anymore. It's not about our stuff anymore. It's, it's, it's all about God. It's His. It all becomes His. That's the reason when we become Christians, we obey the gospel. We experience a death and a burial and a resurrection. Romans chapter 6 tells us. Well, that death is putting off the old self. Putting off old self. I hope I'm talking to people today that have put off the old self. Have you unloaded? Are you still loaded down? See? You still have the anxieties and the worries and the concerns for the world, the worldly stuff. Have you unloaded and said, no, it's not about that anymore. That all belongs to Jesus, all belongs to God. I've unloaded. I buried that and risen with Christ, to become Christ. Everything we've talked about today is that. He said, put off the old self. You can't think new. You can't think like God. You think like you. Think like me. See, you've got to put off the old ways of thinking so we can think like Him. The lame man. Put forth his efforts for the thing could be done. You've got to admire him for that. In Luke chapter 1, verse 36 to 37, when the angel is talking to Mary, Jesus' mother, the angel talks to her in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is, this is now the sixth month that he has, he has been in her womb. For God, nothing is impossible. Talking about John's going to be, be born. He said, for God, nothing is impossible. Here's this old lady going to have a baby. She's six months alone, along. And the angel says, for God, nothing is impossible. Do you think in those terms? Do I think in those terms? Do we think, oh, this is impossible. This can't be the one. God says, no, you can't by you, but I can do it. And I can do it through you. And with you, Christians are looking. Christians look for the impossible, and, and look at things that are possible, and think, well, what are the, what are the possibilities of this to be done? How can I do the impossible? There's an old story about a king, had a kingdom. In this kingdom, this king had a, a stallion, an Arabian stallion, a great, wonderful horse. And one day he goes out to check on his horse, and the horse disappeared was gone. Made the king so mad. He goes back in and says, somebody's got my horse. He looks everywhere for his horse. Can't find the horse. The text tells everybody about the horse. Can't find the horse anywhere. He puts out a decree. Has it signed, put up in the village. Has it put up all over his kingdom. Anyone found with this horse will be hung. So they looked day and night for this horse, trying to find this horse. Couldn't find the horse anywhere. Finally, after months, the man comes in, the king's on his throne. He says, well, I found your horse. He says, you found my horse? Is it alive? Says, oh, yeah, it's alive. It's better than I've ever seen it before in my life. This thing's great. And he says, um, what is it at? He says, way on the other side of your kingdom, there's kind of a hidden meadow over there. And a man's over there training your horse, even when we speak. He says, really? He says, you're not going to believe who's training the horse. Your best friend, the village blacksmith, is training that horse. You're kidding me. No, he's, he's over there right now. We can, go, we can go now. Well, all the king's men, all the king's horses, they load up and they go over there and they get it. Sure enough, the guy's got him on a long line. He's working him around on a long line out there. King pull, walks up. He says, you got my horse. He says, yeah, you caught. I've got your horse. He says, 
there is a, there's a poster on the front of your blacksmith shop that says a man will be killed it's found with this horse. We're best friends. I can't believe you stole my horse. And he said, yeah, we are. But let me tell you something. That's the most wonderful horse I've ever seen in my life. I'll never see a horse as wonderful as that horse is. He's strong. He's smart. He's beautiful. He, he's great shape. I, I had to have that horse. I'm the best horse trainer I've ever known in my life. And I thought, I don't want to die without getting trained a horse that great. And so I got your horse. Well, they loaded up the man, got the horse, took him back to the kingdom, got him there before the throne, sit him down here and said, I hate to tell you this. With tears in his eyes, the king says, I've got to hang you. You stole my horse. The man says, that's okay. Let's make a deal. He says, make a deal? Uh, there's no deal. The man's going to die that had the horse. He says, well, that's okay. You can, you can kill me in a year. But I think your horse is so smart, and I'm such a good horse trainer, I can train your horse to fly. <laughs> says, You're kidding me. Well, all the people in the court started laughing, and he started laughing. He said, I think, I think that horse is that smart. I don't train him to do anything. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. A year from today, if my horse can't fly, we're going to hang you. He said, okay. So he turns around, takes the horse, and he starts walking out. Another man walks up to him and says, hey, fella, you just made a huge mistake. He said, what do you mean? She just told the king if you couldn't get his horse to fly, that he could kill you. So what? He says, you're going to die. He said, now, wait a minute. You're not thinking about the possibilities here. He's possibilities. He said, possibilities are that king's getting to be an old man. If he's dead in a year, he can't enforce his decree. Well, that's right. I'm getting to be an old man. If I'm dead in a year, he can't kill me. Well, that's right. Horses die all the time. If that horse dies, I can't teach you how to fly. He said, well, that's right. He said, who knows? In a year, I may be able to figure out how to teach horses how to fly. Well, today I've been telling you something. To think about the possibilities. Don't think about the impossibilities, you see. So many times we're so glued in on the impossible. What are the chances of me ever thinking like Jesus? Ever doing what God wants me to do? Think possibilities. He's saying, get your mind on the possibilities. Here's the road to achievement. You next think there's achievement. Give you the road to achievement. So many things in life defeat us. But why do some overcome? Some people overcome with intense desire. Intense desire. Underline, write desire in your blank, underline it, circle it. Intense desire. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want to think like Jesus? How bad do you want to be like Jesus? Really and truly, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you place yourself in your desire, determination? Be like Jesus. To make an effort. Your next point there is effort. Accept God's grace. Make the effort. Put it forth. Don't let another day go forward without saying, no, wait a minute. I'm giving it all I got. Follow Him. First, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. God says, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. God is saying, I can do this thing. I can do this with you. I can help you to overcome. Power of Christ when the power is in Christ, we get the opportunity. The opportunity is here. you got the opportunity today to do it and to go for it. With Him, we conquer what's been conquering us. What sin has been conquering you? All kinds of sins. Is it mental? Is it physical? Is it spiritual? Is it a relationship? What's a sin? With Him, we overcome by looking at the possibilities. Then I want to close Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? He who spared not His Son, but delivered Him up for us all, shall, how shall He not with Him so freely give all th things? He says, God's given His greatest gift to you. He's given you all things. The last thing I want to share with you is John 5, 14. Jesus comes to this guy later. After it's all over, after he's been healed, after he took his bed up, he finds him again. And when he finds him again, he says, you better stop sinning. You better stop sinning. 
Because if you don't stop sinning, what's happened before is nothing. A worse thing's going to happen to you than what's happened before. Now, it's interesting. After Jesus heals somebody, after people overcome, we can't get back in the same thing again. It's so tempting. Satan wants us to get back in the same thing again. But Jesus no, wait a minute. You can't do that. You can't stay in the sin. If you've gotten back in, you become a Christian, you've obeyed, you've followed, you've done well, and you've gotten back in the same thing again, or gotten complacent. So it don't matter anymore. He said, I'm warning you, don't get back into that. Get out of it now. If you need to rededicate your life this morning, if you need to be baptized for your sins, if you need to obey the gospel, God is saying, get up, get up, do it now. Don't put it off. It's amazing when we think about this could be the last day of our lives. could be the last day of your life. Is it that important? Yes, it's that urgent. Take care of it now. Whatever needs to be taken care of your spiritual life, won't you come together with Stan as we sing?